Welcome everyone. We're thrilled that you're all with us. Welcome to the third webinar in Journalists for Human Rights new series, Information Saves Lives, coordinated in this case by the Indigenous Reporters Program at JHR. JHR has made space in this series to discuss what we believe to be a particularly timely and important topic in the media, the call for meaningful diversity in the newsroom. But first, we do wish to acknowledge the land on which Journalists for Human Rights head office operates and recognize the longstanding relationships that indigenous nations have, have with these territories. For thousands of years, this has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Toronto, or Toronto, is in the dish with one spoon territory and is home to indigenous peoples from many nations across Turtle Island who continue to care for this land today. We are all treaty people. And for JHR, this means acknowledging the responsibilities that we all bear to uphold treaties that, misunderstood and neglected as they have been for generations, still govern the land we are on to this day. JHR further recognizes and supports the importance of truth, storytelling, and accurate and respectful coverage of histories and current day events as essential to decolonization and reconciliation. This conversation follows an op-ed published by IRP program lead Megan Fowler and myself in the Globe and Mail with a call for newsrooms to reflect the populations that they serve and remove barriers to allow for diversity at all levels of the media. The conversation will be led by journalists whose voices and experiences throughout their careers have been highly influential to this movement. The conversation will be moderated by Karen Pugliese, journalism professor at Ryerson, former executive director of news and current affairs at APTN. Karen will be in discussion with Adrian Harewood, co-host of CBC News Ottawa, Anita Lee, media strategist, journalism professor and co-founder of Canadian Journalists of Color, and Brandy Moran, a French Cree and Iroquois journalist from Treaty 6 in Alberta, whose award-winning work is featured in Canadian and media outlets around the world. JHR is a nonprofit. Donations help us to continue this important work. We are grateful to CT CTV News for their sponsorship of this series, and we ask if you are inspired or moved by what you hear in the coming hour to please consider donating using the donate button on your screen. Now I'll hand it over to Megan Fowler, program lead of our seven year strong award-winning Indigenous Reporters Program to take it away. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, so the Indigenous Reporters Program at JHR aims to increase the quality and quantity of Indigenous stories and voices in Canadian media. We've been busy pivoting our programming to online platforms, so please stay tuned for more information by following our Facebook page, uh, JHR Indigenous, and the hashtag uh, JHR Indigenous on Twitter. And in August, we will be launching a series called Virtual Circles, uh, community forums on media topics from Indigenous perspectives. And we look forward to having you join us in these conversations. Uh, now I'll hand it over to our moderator, Karen. Thank you so much. I wanna really thank um, Megan and Rachel and JHR for creating this space and this opportunity for us to all be here today. Um, we've promised a conversation about what meaningful diversity in Canada, Canadian media looks like and the solidarity movement that's leading the way. But I'd actually like to reverse that and talk a little bit about the solidarity movement and why it's happening. Um, I, I've got some stats here from uh, the New York Times. They say the movement, although it's still going on, uh, peaked on June 6th with a half a million people turning out at nearly 550 places across the United States. Pew Research Center estimates 15 million people have joined it or joined it between June 4th and 10th. So Adrian, I, I know the catalyst for this was a very violent death of George Floyd at the hands of police, but this reaction, because these, these things have happened before, why is this reaction happening now? You know, Carolyn, I think it's really hard to, to say. It, it's, it's quite a, a strange alchemy, a confluence of, of all kinds of different things. Uh, we can attribute it to social media. We're living in the social media age. And so social media certainly allows these stories to be passed on very quickly. And, and so we see the kind of emergence of these, these transnational movements, uh, movements really around the world. Uh, we're living in the middle of a pandemic as well, the coronavirus pandemic. 
uh, in which racialized people have been suffering in particular ways. Uh, they've been suffering disproportionately. Uh, and I think that that was also, that has also been a factor. It's also means that people have more time uh, to engage in, in these kinds of activities. And I'm thinking particularly uh, about young people. Um, you know, so those, those are some other, you know, issues that I think contributed to the, the fact that, that so many people uh, were moved to, to respond. I, I think also, and again, we can't just get away from the, the vile nature of what took place to George Floyd. Like it was the murder in plain sight, live on television, this, this execution uh, really troubled people uh, and, and troubled all kinds of people. And, and I think it moved people to act. Um, but it's always difficult to, to provide a kind of an explanation as to why exactly things happen when they do. You know, I think that this was the spark uh, that led to an explosion, really, of activity. And, and you know, we are here uh, as a result. And so the, the movement does come up into Canada. And uh, Anita, I know that you spent some time covering Black Lives Matter in the U.S., but you've also been following it very much in Canada. Can, can you explain what that movement looks like here and the, how, it's, how it's being shaped in Canada? Um, well, I feel like there was a uh, there was a lot of influence, obviously, from our uh, neighbors to the south, obviously. But I, I echo for me, I really echo what Adrian said about how COVID has really laid bare systemic inequities in our society. So obviously, we can see, you know, um, coronavirus is disproportionately impacting African American communities in the U.S. Um, you can see an increase in hate crimes against um, people of East Asian descent um, around the world, but especially in North America. And a lot of folks who live in remote regions, including indigenous communities, have uh, you know a, a more difficult time accessing test kits. So it really just a lot of you know people talked about COVID as like this great equalizer, but it really just laid bare the fact that there are systemic inequities in society that we have yet to address. And I think that really did accelerate the conversation and provided a catalyst in addition to the, the death of George Floyd um, for people to really open their eyes. And for me, like, you know, for people who have been doing this work for a long time, it's not like this has suddenly popped up, um, including in this country, you know. Um, uh, but uh, I feel like now people are, because of the fact that we have had this time to really take a hard look at our systems and a hard look at how we run society, uh, people are, I feel like this is a reckoning um, and hopefully one that will lead to actual solutions. Can I add one other thing, Karen? Can I also sure. say that, that, that we're also living in an age of populism, of rising populism around the globe and also rising fascism. And, and, and I think that that, 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 was, that also explained uh, the part of the response, like why people felt the need to, to go out and, and show themselves. Uh, in, in many instances, it was a reaction against the political climate in mm. which we're living in. And, and it was, uh, it was, it was the, and these, these were acts of resistance as well. I would also like to add, just for Canadian context, there was a lot of um, in occurrences that led up to this moment. And that included, obviously, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau wearing brown face and black face and the reaction to that the fact that there was like such a polarized reaction between you know half of all like a portion of Canadians being shocked by this uh, shocked by the fact that this could happen and then a portion of Canadians feeling like okay this is not this is not too much of a surprise given the daily lived experiences of a lot of racialized people in this country that has gone invisible for a long time including in our in a lot of media organizations in this country and beyond that there's also an uh, op-ed out of the Vancouver Sun um, that said, for which they apologized later on, that said that ethnic diversity was harmful to this country, which is really going against our constitution, given that multiculturalism is, has been entrenched in our constitution for decades now. Um, so we've had, there was a build up to this conversation and I think we're at a head. Yeah, and I, I remember that article, it wasn't just um, saying that uh, diversity was harmful, it was um, relying on research that actually said the opposite. Um, so it was sort of almost, uh, it, it was a disastrous um, decision for the media to publish that. It wasn't, it, it wasn't fact-checked. It was uh, mm -hmm. twisting information in a way that made it wrong. Yes. Um, I, I want to go to Brandy now. Um, and I, I'm going to ask you to, to answer a question that I, I know you're brave enough to answer. But th there was this moment when uh, Black Lives Matter was coming up into Canada and a lot of people who are social media influencers were saying, 
Indigenous people need to be quiet right now and let Black Lives Matter have its moment. And I remember liking those comments on social media and saying, yeah, we should we should be quiet. And then as it went on for, for a couple of weeks, more and more we're seeing um, our chance to connect to this movement. We're seeing things that are happening uh, to Black people that happen to our people. And uh, you came in and you wrote, uh, I think one of the first articles that, that opened up the space for Indigenous people to join into the conversation. But it wasn't an easy thing to do. And I, I wanted to, if you just talk about that a little bit. Definitely. Well, um, this struggle is a struggle, a shared struggle from day one <laughs> um, between uh, people of co color and indigenous people that live on these lands of America called America. Um, it's it's uh, not something that um, ever been separate or that we've ever been divided upon. It, we've always been together um, supporting each other in, in solidarity with, with um, so many of these struggles. So when I came out and I, and I seen everything that was happening as a result of George, George Floyd, I was so inspired that so many people were finally getting it, finally um, seeing and understanding um, and being outraged, right, by these injustices that are happening. But I also seen uh, many people here in Canada um, coming out, you know, in support in droves and just being shocked and acting, you know, acting so enraged by what was going on. And I was like, I was kind of stunned by, by, by their actions. I was like, this has been going on in our country on so many levels for so many years in, you know, genocidal levels against indigenous peoples and peoples of color. And all of a sudden, you know, they're coming on board. And so um, I was like, where, you know, where have you been all along this time? And then I wrote about it and I wrote about how Prime Minister Trudeau was quick to go take a knee at Parliament Hill uh, to stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, which is amazing. And it's great that he did that. But it was also to me hypocritical of him when he hasn't acted or taken that kind of uh, solidarity with the oppression against Indigenous peoples in this country. And so I had written about that and, and I believe that article is, I wonder who will march with indigenous peoples with that same kind of passion, with that same kind of outreach. And, and also um, talking about how, you know, we're in this together and it's not necessarily one and apart from each other because um, I got attacked by, you know, different, um, I guess, influencers who are indigenous. But uh, yeah, our own people. Yeah. And I'm saying, you know, yeah, like you, you shouldn't be talking about this or, you know, be quiet or you're taking it away from this. And, and I was, I was having a conversation with somebody and they, about it. And they said, you know what, that is a colonial construct that there's not enough room. There's more than enough room for all of us to be having these conversations because we're in it together and we're supporting each other together. It is the same fight. I, I want to go to Anita because I see her nodding there. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I just, I, <laughs> I totally agree with what Brandy says. Like to me, this is a collective effort and not just on the part of like racialized people in Canada, all Canadians are going to benefit from greater di diversity, especially if we're talking about it in the context of media, because storytelling is ultimately what bridges gaps. It's what reduces polarization. Um, I don't actually understand the reluctance um, uh, or the reticence of a lot of institutions uh, uh, that prevent them from embracing diversity and inclusion because it, in such a polarizing time, I think it's incumbent on us and it's a, it's a civic responsibility for us to work on this issue to, together collectively um, because it is to the benefit of all Canadians. If I can just add, Karen, and, and I was going to ask you to jump in there, Adrian. Yeah, please. no, no, just but just in a very material way, there's been a long-standing relationship between between Indigenous peoples and peoples of African descent. You know, even for example, if you if you look at just 30 years ago, we're marking the 30 30 years of Kanatsitake of of, of of what it's also called as Oka Oka. You know, that time was a time of solidarity. That was a time when when Black communities, Black individuals, Black organizations supported 
uh, their indigenous brothers wow. and indigenous sisters. If we look at, for example, in the, in the Black Power movement uh, in, the, in the 1960s, the American Indian movement was very much influenced and had relationships with, right. with the Black Panther Party and, and, and took a lot of lessons from them and, and vice versa. There, there were exchanges. Uh, and going back to, to times of, of slavery in, in North America, there were also relationships between peoples of African descent and indigenous peoples, uh, you know, in, in which uh, black peoples were sheltered at times by indigenous peoples. So I think that there's a long, there's a long relationship and, and that relationship needs to be referenced. For sure. I remember when I was growing up, uh, not to date myself, but uh, I remember Lee Miracle, uh, who's a few years older than me, uh, really being influenced by the Black Panthers movement and William Whitney. So some of our, our great leaders and thinkers in the indigenous community were really looking for guidance from the Black civil rights movement. Um, I want to shift the conversation now a little bit into uh, media, um, because this became a conversation uh, about institutions, systematic racism, and uh, institutional racism. And uh, we started talking also about how media might be part of the problem and suffering from some of the same things. Um, I know, Anita, you had mentioned, uh, you were talking about systems a minute ago, and I wanted to pick up on that and get you to reflect on why there isn't diversity in our media institutions. I mean, I would flip that question back around to some establishment media institutions in our country and ask them the, that question. Um, because the, the civic case, the business case, and the moral imperative uh, for diversity and inclusion have all, has, has long been established, right? Um, I can speak to that now if you'd like. Uh, really, I mean, at the at the very baseline level, from a business case, uh, you know, media institutions around the world, including in Canada, are losing money. They're losing resources, and uh, as the advertising model has become less reliable in terms of generating sustainable revenue for media institutions, a lot of these organizations are pivoting towards membership and subscription, and those um, business models are actually incumbent on serving they depend on serving audiences properly with the stories that reflect their lives. So it's actually in a lot of media institutions best interest to start expanding their audiences to serving new and underrepresented and diverse audiences because it'll actually expand their, their revenue potential and their revenue sources. Beyond that, there's like the civic case and the dem democratic case. Uh, media is a pillar of democracy. Uh, we are, we're the fifth estate, we're supposed to hold uh, political institutions accountable. And there's a lot of research that shows, shows that if people don't have access to local news or news that reflects their daily lives, then they're less likely to civically engage, they're less likely to vote, and they're less likely to trust their neighbors, neighbors, which is, you know, just a hotbed for misinformation and polarization. So, and then finally, there's a the moral imperative, obviously, you know, humanizing people, understanding that uh, telling stories and consuming stories from other communities will only just bridge understanding and bridge gaps. To me, these reason, this reasoning has been long in, been established. So at some point, you know, enough conversation, you have all the information, just start taking action. The, the solutions have already been outlined as well, very clearly. And uh, Adrian, can you talk a little bit about the, the importance of diversifying newsrooms? W what is it that BIPOC people bring to the table? Why should newsrooms be hiring uh, us? Oh, I think you're muted, Adrian. I, I would concur with, with everything that, that Anita said. I, I would just add that this is about competence. It, it's about professionalism. And it's about doing your job. If you are not reflective of the society, you're going to do bad journalism, period. You, you cannot cover, if you, if you don't have people who know stories or who have the context or who are able to kind of see things in a complex, nuanced way, you cannot, you're, you're doing a disservice to the people that subscribe to you. You're doing a disservice to your listeners, to your viewers, to, to readers. Uh, you cannot tell uh, a story in an effective way if you don't have people with that kind of knowledge, that kind of exposure, even that kind of interest or that kind of perspective. Uh, so just from in a very, very basic, uh, the basic argument is that it's bad journalism, right? And, 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 it, it, and we're not, you're not doing your job. And, you're, you're, you, and it's, it's, it's a sign of incompetent leadership and, and a lack of understanding of what's actually required of a person in that, or, 
or uh, what's required of people in that position who are in decision-making positions. And uh, Brandy, as the, the um, out in the field working journalist freelancer, um, I, I wanted to get your opinions on that. I know that you've worked uh, in some mainstream newsrooms and uh, you did, made a decision to go out and freelance. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, I used to work with Karen at APTN National News. She was my news director. And actually I was supported by Journalists for Human Rights. Just, just wanted to let you know that. Um, great program. Um, so I've been um, doing freelance for a number of years now. And a couple of years I was working for CBC uh, Indigenous and I just decided to step away there. They had a great vision to um, you know, tell the stories of our people um, by building this, you know, uh, this team of Indigenous journalists across Canada. But I felt like we were still kind of kept within the box of that corporation um, in regards to how we went about telling our, our stories. Maybe some of it had to do with because we were still, um, you know, we were still doing the daily news kind of aspect to our stories. We didn't really have the opportunities to go too much in depth or, um, you know, reach out and go in and explore our communities much, as much. So I felt that that was lacking. Um, and uh, I decided to leave. I decided that, you know, to take that risk, to take that chance to go freelance so that I could go deeper because a lot of media, like, organizations, they don't have the resources, they don't have the understanding or the know-how that this kind of thing is needed in order to really give our stories justice, in order to really um, unearth all the stories that have never been told, um, that need to be told. Um, it has to be done properly. It has to be done um, outside of the construct of what uh, traditional you know, media uh, does nowadays. So um, fortunately, I'm in a place where I'm, I'm able to do that right now. And uh, Anita, I want to um, just, I, I have to try to get this uh, quote in. We're getting close to time, I think, um, where I want to, I see some questions coming in and I want to go to questions from the audience. Uh, but you wrote something in Policy Options that um, it just really hit me because, I mean, APTN started up and I think, um, uh, for a lot of alternative media, we, we get very proud of our institutions. But you'd written, there are ethnic media outlets in Canada, but they're ghettoized into a two-tier system, where first, the establishment media is seen as more legitimate, and two, seemingly absolved from covering issues that matter to immigrant Canadians in an in-depth way. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Like, it really, it really struck me. APTN's struggle to be seen as legitimate news source <laughs> was so long and so hard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is something that I think about quite a bit because I have a firm belief based on research and just my own lived experience that actually uh, younger generations of Canadians, particularly those who are from communities of color, are very underserved in by any sort of media because, you know, there's establishment media um, that largely serves like, let's be honest, middle-class white Canadians. Um, and then there is, you know, ethnic media that my parents watch. So it's things like Omni or, you know, the local like Ming Pao newspaper. Uh, but that doesn't resonate with me as somebody who's born and raised in Canada. Um, and my first language is English, right? So there's, there's a different experience that you have when you're somebody who's like second or third generation that is, has not, or has been inadequately reflected um, in like at, uh, by major media organizations in this country. It has obviously improved over the last few years because of a lot of the grassroots efforts to basically, you know, uh, inform these organizations that they're not doing an adequate job, but uh, definitely there's, that's, for me, that's what I'm referring to. There's just like, there's this weird hierarchy in Canadian media where like, uh, I remember being in journalism school and being told there were like literally maybe three or four places that were the only places worth working. And that to me, that kind of elitism has always struck me as so off-putting because as journalists, we're serving the public. I mean, there shouldn't be absolutely no elitism within journalism institutions because you are, you're like Adrian said, you're reflecting all of Canada. Your job is to serve the public. You know, it's not to serve your own ego. Um, 
and that that is what I was referring to in that piece. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, we've got some people writing in some questions and um, these are great questions. They're, they're asking, how do we solve the problem? So um, I'm gonna uh, read a couple of those out and uh, I'll just let you guys jump in. Um, the first question says, oftentimes organizations hire BIPOC only to pigeonhole them into specific areas. Black journalists ask to write about race, effectively, effectively reducing them to one aspect of their identity. How do we overcome such tokenism? Who would like to take that? I could take that, but I want to make space for Adrian and Brandy if they want to go first. Go ahead, Nanita. Um, okay, so this is something I think about all the time, and it's part of the reason why I actually moved to the U.S. to work. Um, so I worked in New York City and covered the U.S. presidential election. So I was there from 2015 to 2017. And prior to that, I had worked at American media institutions since 2012 after leaving the Toronto Star. And part, a big part of that reason was because uh, the part of the impetus was because I really wanted to cover a uh, report on race relations. And there was just absolutely no room for that, even in 2011. And I'm not that old. I'm in my early 30s. So that that is something that so that relates to what I'm saying uh, relates to your question, because I think about how I'm treated in these two media ecosystems. And right now I'm very much still very connected. I still have a very large network in the US, I'm still very connected to people because I sit in the online news association board of directors. And then I'm very much connected to the Canadian media ecosystem. And I'm called to speak publicly and do research um, in both ecosystems. And in Canada, I am almost exclusively called on to talk about diversity, even though my actual areas of expertise are audience engagement and revenue and media innovation. Diversity is something that I just feel very strongly about that I need to to, to talk about just because it, it seems to be falling on deaf ears or has been for a long time. So I wanna be able to contribute to the movement. But in the US, my expertise is, and I don't wanna be reduc reductive about this. Obviously this is specific to my experience in New York City, but I feel like I'm respected for my expertise. I oftentimes speak about audience engagement. I am consulting on Google's project Oasis, which looks at uh, uh, building sustainable future for local news in North America. I'm part of a lot of cool, exciting projects that I don't have the opportunity to take on in Canada. So my answer to that person is actually, I've been, re been very strategic about my career in order to be empowered. And it took a lot of thought on my part. And what I did was actually build a name for myself in the US and uh, be able to basically get, uh, basically associate myself with institutions like the Online News Association, and City University of New York, where I also teach, that basically establishes me as an expert in my field, even when my own, you know, my own industry doesn't necessarily or has has had a harder time accepting that. And that is like the most honest answer I think I will give and have given actually on this. Um, and you have to be really strategic. I really don't think there's like a linear path straightforward to the top of Canadian media, unless you conform to certain things that may go against your own principles, or at least that's how I felt. Um, and so I just, as a principled person, I just really wanted to do what I felt was right. And so that requires me to be a little more experimental in my approach to my career path. And that's something that I want to tell younger journalists and especially journalists of color that is possible, that the industry is changing and that I'm very optimistic in spite of what we're discussing here today, in, st in spite of the dragging of feet around diversity in, in this industry. Does anybody want to jump in and uh, just just kind of play off that with uh, solutions to diversify media? Yeah, Karen, I'm, I'm not sure if this is what happens when, when you you get close to 50, but I'm, I'm turning 50 this year. And so I'm, I'm starting to be a lot Happy really <laughs> feeling old, but, but becoming just really reflective on the, the journey that I've taken to here. Mm -hmm. And and I'm going to talk about something that I, I kind of kept close to my chest maybe over the last 15 odd years. But when I was first hired to be the afternoon host of the Drive Home Show in Ottawa uh, back in 2006, early on in my tenure, uh, one of my colleagues suggested that, I, that my hiring was tokenistic, right? That I was basically hired because I was the black guy from Ottawa who was going to be hosting the show. And I must say that I think as a result of that, and maybe other things as well, I felt a particular kind of pressure to demonstrate that I was competent in all kinds of different areas and that I could, and that I wasn't just a race hire, right? So I, I, I made a point, I think, of demonstrating that I could talk about sports, I could talk about literature, I could talk about history, I could talk about philosophy, whatever the case might be, whatever you put at me, I'm going to do it. 
And, and I made a point in, in particular of doing a lot of book fairs or, or, or with the Auto Writers Festival. You know, I was, I was keen on demonstrating my range, right? And, and now I'm, I'm a bit resentful about that actually now, right? Because I feel as if I shouldn't have felt that way. I shouldn't have felt that I had to show my bona fides, that I had to show my competence. Um, but I felt I needed to establish myself as a person who had range. Um, and I don't want the next generation to feel that way, right? I don't want them to feel that they have to do anything other than what their colleagues do, right? I, and, and your job when you're in this role is to be excellent. Your job is like anything, your job is to do your best and, and to uh, you know, keep your eyes on that prize and to be ambitious and to just do good work, do good journalism. Um, you shouldn't have to be worrying about how you're being judged or how you're being seen or whether people think you're actually capable. Uh, but I will admit that I was driven by that for, for quite a, a, a while, quite, quite a long time. And, and I, I probably, you know, was one of the busier people in the city because of that, <laughs> right? Because I felt I needed to demonstrate that I could do it and that yeah. there were questions about my competence. You know, I, I relate to that. I had a, a similar but different experience. Uh, I, I got started at APTN. If it weren't for APTN, I'd probably be a technical writer right now because uh, that's what I was doing. But um, that had something different to do than I think with race was because I was trying to break in with Ottawa. And you know how Ottawa is a market that's very difficult to break into. But I spent six years at APTN. Um, and I left there saying I spent a lot of time covering the Hill. I saw myself as somebody who had the skills of a Hill reporter. And when I went and I knocked on mainstream doors, all they saw was the Indian. And if they didn't have a job to cover indigenous issues, um, they didn't consider the, the other work I'd done legitimate in any way. Um, they didn't think I could ask questions or report on anything else. Um, I mean, obviously um, I did love reporting on my people and I went back and made a career out of it. Um, I did find other small agencies that would, would take me on and let me do other topics and explore other parts of journalism but it was tough. Uh, Brandy, you're, you're uh, younger, I think, than uh, either I or Adrian are. Um, how, how have you yeah. found your career path? And what, what do you think needs to happen to diversify newsrooms? Yeah, so I started out in the mainstream um, for the first few years and I actually purposely worked to be able to um, solely, you know, tell indigenous stories and to create my own beat as a, freelancer in this um so I, I just I wasn't I wasn't as interested in in mainstream so um it's different it's different for me <laughs> I'm not out there you know uh trying I'm actually out there trying to um get our stories to the mainstream and for them to take our stories seriously and you know be interested in them right so um it's on on that level um I think for solutions that newsrooms should seriously um, look at investing in um, journalists, reporters of color and indigenous peoples, um, investing in beats, investing in areas where they can uh, solely focus on um, delving into and, and exploring um, the underreported communities here that we're talking about to really be able to have the resources and the time um, uh, to be able to do it. I, I, I just think that there's so much out there that needs to be told that, you know, that, that uh, to help create these bridges, you know, between our societies that Anita was talking to, right? Reconciliation on all these different levels um, so that you know, so that I, I just think that it that they should get the money if it's really important to them, as they say it is to do, uh, get the people of color and indigenous people hired and get them out there uh, in the communities telling the stories. And, you know, it, it, I feel like I just want to talk a little bit about when you came to APTN, Brandy. Because Brandy's a champion, right? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> I, it was really hard to find Indigenous people even to work at APTN because only 50% of our kids ever finished high school. By no means do all of them go on to university, to uh, college. And most of them do go into legal and social work. Not so many journalists will that 
we're seeing more. So uh, Brandy had applied for a job. She didn't have the technical DJ skills for it. And I offered her to come in as a paid intern. And if she could come in for three months, we would do that training with her. So, so I, you know, first of all, I'd like to see more of that in mainstream offices, but just to show you how determined people are to get these jobs, she's a mom. She had to find care for her kids. Uh, she had to find a place to live. She brought her dog with her. Um, <laughs> she did a lot of personal sacrifice to be able to do those three months. From Alberta to Winnipeg in the dead of winter in an old beat up red, barely running Pontiac and got my butt there. <laughs> so, I mean, if you make the space and you make the opportunities, I mean, people, people will, do, will do incredible things to, to take them. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go on to this. I Karen, think this Karen, can yeah, I just sure, say one quick thing? I, I hope that people are, are listening to what you said because you, your example is a model of what our leaders and what decision makers can do uh, if they are intentional and if they have the will to do it. You know, these things are solvable. This, this, pro this is not an intractable problem. You know, we know how to solve the issue. We know what to do. And, and a lot of it is about opportunity. A lot of it is about support. A lot of it is about encouragement, mentorship. We have the tools to do it. It's a question of whether we have the will to do it and whether we have the de decision makers, the people in positions of power with the vision and the actual commitment to making change and, and to actually having um, you know, having newsrooms that do reflect the diversity of the society. Thank you for that, Adrian. Um, I want to get to this question. This might be the one that we end on, um, but it was, this is a great question. Thank you for sending this in. Um, how can consumers of media challenge newsrooms to be more representative of the diversity in our society, both in the stories that are told and the people telling those stories? We'd like to start out on that one. I definitely, yeah, we haven't heard from you in a while. Go yeah. for it. So I think uh, so. Change happens when there's internal and external pressure. Like every successful mass movement has had both pressure from internal and external sources. And I think the public can play a really positive role, and a big role in encouraging um, media institutions to change. So uh, my organization, Canadian Journalists of Color, released seven calls to action to strengthen newsroom diversity across the country. Um, I encourage you guys uh, to go to cjoc.net slash white uh, hyphen paper uh, to share and amplify those calls to action. Basically email uh, your favorite media institution, your regular news source uh, to, to demand uh, greater diversity at all levels of the organization, uh, behind the scenes and in, in front of the scenes. Um, and I would also say uh, beyond that, I would actually say to pay to start subscribing and paying uh, emerging media outlets, especially in this country, that are walking the walk. So there's a lot of cool places like the discourse where I used to work, places like the Narwhal, the Sprawl. Um, there's like a burgeoning media ecosystem in this country that is uh, building diversity and inclusion into their foundation, which I think is the only way to go. Like you cannot ghettoize diversity and inclusion. It's not for committee. It's supposed, it should be institutionalized from the, the get-go. And so paying those organizations and allowing them to do journal journalism in a sustainable fashion is very positive. I also want to uh, is also like I also want to add uh, one quick solution that I I've encountered in my research, which I think is a really cool way to address this issue, especially for more under resourced newspapers. So the Detroit Free Press um, is a publication that is in a city that's eighty percent black, um, and they have largely uh, served exclusively the suburban population of Detroit, which is largely white. So they're actually serving the 20%. So because management um, at that newspaper is well aware of this issue and well aware of how that's impacting polarization and democracy in the city, they actually partnered with an emerging media outlet um, called Bridge Detroit that just launched recently that is fully staffed by, I think it's like 100% people of color. And they also have a community advisory board that is majority or either 100% people of color. Um, and they are serving that 80%. Um, and they you specialize in community engagement. They specialize in uh, basically uh, working with communities to surface coverage that's relevant to their lives. And so this is an example of collaboration by an establishment organization and an emerging one to pool resources to basically like yeah. properly serve the city of Detroit. So there's a lot of amazing kind of solutions coming up. 
that I don't even hear, you know, industry leaders in Canadian media discussing yet, um, which is alarming personally, because, you know, I'm not an establishment leader, but I'm aware of these things. So they should be as well. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there because there's a lot of cool solutions that are, is, that are giving me a lot of optimism for the future of media. Yeah, and in terms of audience, I don't know, Brandy, maybe you can comment. Like, I mean, I think there's been a pretty active uh, Indigenous community on social media influencing the way mainstream media is covering uh, our issues right now. Any, any thoughts on that or any other thoughts? Um, definitely. Well, I just um, totally um, align what Anita said, Anita said with um, supporting new and emerging uh, uh, news organizations. As Adrian said, like these, these organizations, in my experience, they actually have that will and determination to do this. They have that interest. They just lack the resources. Um, so subscribe, you know, five bucks a week or whatever it is. That's how you're going to be able to get on board to help shift the narratives. So, so important. Um, again, social media, like you were saying, um, does play a role. We're in this era of social media, right? Uh, where we, we have a uh, collective say and voice, you know, like never before. So uh, in, in, in Indian country, or as we're seeing at the George Floyd uh, uh, movement here after, you know, his death, social media has played that role in all of these conversations that we're having right now, right? So we do have to take that into consideration um, in helping um, to create uh, that pressure for what we want to be uh, consuming. And, and Adrian, I'm going to give you, yeah, final word goes and, to Adrian. And, and, and movements matter. And, and, and people, I think too often, people underestimate the power that they actually have, the power that they have to make change uh, and to influence what goes on within media organizations. Uh, the fact is, and I can speak specifically about CBC, that's the organization which I work, it's the public broadcaster. CBC is owned by the people of this territory, right? The people in this place we're calling Canada, in Canada, they own the CBC. And so they have a stake in what occurs there. Uh, and they have, if they choose to, they can exercise their responsibility of, of uh, voicing their concerns. And, and if, if they are, if they want to see things um, move, they can write a letter or they can go on social media or they can go on, into the streets. You know, there are all kinds of possibilities. There are, there are all kinds of ways of influencing change. And, and I will say that I know that, that the, those in power uh, will either choose to listen or they'll be forced to listen. Mm. And, and citizens can force uh, these powers, they, they can force organizations to listen, to pay attention. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna wrap it uh, there. I wanna thank everybody who sent in questions and everybody who did join us today. I'm sorry, I know there were a few questions I didn't get to, but we are out of time. And I do have to pass it back to uh, JHR. They've got some closing remarks and some other exciting events that they wanna tell you about coming up. Um, thank you fellow panelists for having this conversation with me today. Rachel. Karen, for your moderation. Karen, it was great. Yes, Taniki Karen. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Karen, for your amazing, the amazing job you did uh, conceptualizing the questions and moderating. <clears throat> and thank you, Adrian, Brandy, and, and, and Anita for sharing uh, the leadership and uh, these stories of courage. Uh, I feel incredibly inspired from this conversation to do much more to ensure that our media reflects the full range and rich richness of diversity in Canada. Um, and to that end, please stay tuned for the community forums, the virtual circle events that uh, Megan mentioned at the top of the hour from the Indigenous Reporters Program and JHR. And the next webinar in the Information Saves Live series will take place in mid-August. Thank you for watching. Please donate if you are able and stay strong. Thank you. <laughs>